this one. You can. Yes. I think I'm there. Okay. So my, which one am I? Whichever one, you know, whichever one you're comfortable with. Excuse I don't know. It, it, me to sit over here. it doesn't yeah, matter. That Wherever was your lighting is good, baby girl, <laughs> I'm here for you, Kelly. That was a power move. That was like, I think you should take. You no, can, because you take the, that my one. my drink was over here on a tee, so I was like, that's probably my seat. They have extra lighting for the beautiful woman right there. Look incredible. And I just you sit my incredible. black ass in the dark, and yeah. it doesn't matter. Whatever. You guys, 50, uh, 50 Shades of Black. I saw uh, 50 Shades of Grey. I'm curious, as soon as you saw it, did you know right away that this is something you could make a parody of, that you just you saw the jokes right away? I knew it when I read the book. And I was like, no, I was going to do my first parody book. I never did a parody book. And I was like, I, I, I was in, intrigued because women were, like, all over this book. Like, I'd go to, I'd be on planes and... It'd be all these house wives, and they had their seat all curled up, and they was watching the book, and they was getting all hot and bothered. And I was like, what the hell is in there? And so I read the book, and I was like, okay, this is funny. And I just kept writing jokes. And then I saw the movie. And when I saw the movie, me and my producer, writing partner, Rick Alvarez, we was, like, we, we was in the theater just writing jokes. And by the time we finished, we had like 10, 15 pages of material. And we was like, oh, my God. And we, we kept watching it, and we just had a bunch of jokes and a bunch of fun characters. It was like, this is definitely a movie. What was it about the material that uh, you think sort of pushed you to write all these jokes, got your creative juices be- flowing? I think it was the character because he is so, I think she was so innocent and he was just like creepy, it, yeah. you know, because it went from like sexy to like stalker. Like, yeah. and I was like looking at the extremes and I was like, he's rich, but it, what if he is black? What would the black experience of this be? You know, <laughs> and, and that's when a lot of the comedy kind of kicked in. So what do you think the black experience would be and how it differs? Because there's only but so much stuff you're going to do to a sister before she's like, uh uh-huh, nigga, no. (laughs) (laughs) Kelly, how did you get get involved with the movie? Um, I heard that Marlon was doing it, and that was kind of the end of it. Like, And then next thing you know, he and I were having this phone conversation where he's like, so just tell me, I just want to know what your boundaries are. Yeah. That's kind of how all... Like, I was very Christian black, but with yeah. comedy. What will you do and what won't you do? And what, what, and what were your boundaries? I didn't really have any, which I learned is a mistake when a guy asks you, like, what are your boundaries? You should probably, like, have a couple. You're like, none, none. Let's do it. Let's I, go. I didn't have none until I got to set, and I was like, hold up, wait, time yeah. out. <laughs> Y'all want to do what? No. And then yeah. you at the time would be like, in the script, sorry, get over there. No, you know, I think it, it's funny because I, I learned something during the process. It's like... You know, as guys, we're different than girls. You know, guys, we just do it. It's just like whatever. Women, even when, you, <laughs> even when you're doing stuff on set, you you you, you got to flirt with them in a way. Like you got to go talk to her. What? You, have to, you know what I mean? Like you have to you have to ease her you through it. You were working me the whole damn. Movie. No, no, no. But I'm just saying the process, Callie. It's it's like you you have to talk to her. You got to, you know, let her know that she's gonna be safe. Let her know that a guy's just like, oh, you want me to do what? Oh, you, I pull my dick out where? <laughs> and a woman is a little different, so you know you have to be a lot more uh, um, understanding well, and a little bit more nurturing. I think a, I think a woman gets on set and has a, a sort of vulnerable scene, whatever that may be, and you look out at your crew, and the majority of your crew, a lot of the time, not all the time, maybe not on this set, but on most sets, it's, it's all men. Yeah. And so it's all guys being like, "When are you going to do that scene?" You know? That was so every scene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, the other thing was, you know, too, I, like I, I want you want them to feel comfortable, and it's awkward because you know we met one time at a phone conversation, first day of filming, we're in the elevator, <laughs> and we got to make out and do crazy stuff. Hi, Callie. Hey, <laughs> nice to meet you. Tongue, Good. Tongue. <laughs> yeah, blah, 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 blah. we're in the elevator kissing for so long. He literally grew a beard. Like he was ripping my face to shreds. She loved and it. And then he has. <laughs> You have all this great like comedy technique because you've been doing funny films for so long and on the most extreme level. So the first time he kissed in the elevator, he looked me in the eye in the way that an improv actor does to see like if you're okay with some crazy thing that's about to happen. And he fake licks my face. So it looks like for the camera, you licked it. But I didn't know this. So I was like, okay, I guess he wants to do this now. So he like fake, like technically licks my face. I just licked his whole face and the fire that came into your eyes. It was like, oh, oh you yeah. want to do this? <laughs> you want to do this? Basically. And so that was day one. And then luckily I didn't have any boundaries. So that's the movie. 
When you're shooting a scene like that, do you know, uh, I mean, she says that you have all these tools in your bag from doing comedy for so long. Do you know that doing the biggest thing is usually the thing that's going to work? Or do you start from the biggest and do several takes of like from the biggest joke to the sort of most subtle joke possible? I go with what I feel at the time. And I, I encourage everybody to improvise. I encourage everybody. I make every writer, I mean, every actor and every, um, especially the comedians, I make them all writers because what you will say and what you will do, I it may not use some of it, but the things that I do use will make the scene better. Um, and I encourage it because it makes you comfortable and you really feel like you're bringing you to the character and you as a performer and your, your instincts. And that's what I want. And, you know, every take, I do something, I try to do something different and I try to have some kind of fun unless, you know, it requires me to just stay in pocket. But for the most part, I don't know what I'm going to do half the time. I just kind of do it. Now you you've been doing this for for a, a long time, going back to I mean it's just it's been in your family. By the way, she's genes. really a really good improviser. Aww. Very very strong in improv. This is how he gets the girls to like lick his face in the elevator. He's just like, <laughs> "What are your you're boundaries, a, girl? You know you're so funny. <laughs> you're a genius improviser. You're a, you're a genius a improviser. improviser. Let me see them titties. Yeah, like <laughs> pretty much." I'm curious as someone who's been doing this for so long, how you create an environment on set still that is safe for you and, and Callie in the sense that you guys are doing really big, really silly things and you're going to have to do them over and over again to make sure to get the right take, to get safeties. How you create an environment that doesn't get, I mean, that would get frustrating to, to yeah, someone how do, like how do you do that? I try to limit the takes. I don't, I don't like doing like 90 takes. You know, we don't have the time. We film these movies in 21 days, which is like unheard of in Hollywood. Normally a movie like this would probably take 50 to 60 days comfortably. We filmed this in 21 days. And we don't like to do a lot of takes because I don't want to wear the actors out. And I think it's best when it's fresh. So if need be, I'll take three to four takes and go. Or if I get two great takes and go. Or two long takes and run them back to back and go. Um, I think that, and you know, I was taught by my brother, you know, uh, Keenan Ivy Wayans, you know, who's one of the greats. And what he's uh, taught me was, you know, you got to keep a comfortable vibe as much as you can. And when you're on set, you're, you know, you're kind of like the leader and your crew. Me, Rick, and Mike set the tone for the whole production. We always work with the same people, you know, so everybody's like family. We laugh a lot, and it's just a, a good time, you know? Is it a family vibe on set, Kelly? Does it make it more comfortable for you as a, as a performer coming in for the first time doing this with them? Um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely felt like that. It felt like I was the like the sister who had just a bunch of brothers. We would kind of make jokes about sensitivity training, kind of going back to what he was saying earlier. I'd be like, you guys, I am a human being inside here, like inside of all this crazy stuff we're doing. It's I'm still alive. It's the sister-in-law that just joins a family full of brothers, <laughs> and they come on set, and it's like, no, you go, you're going to be good. You, you're going to be fine. And then he comes over, he's like, hey, babe, <laughs> nice to meet you. And it's just like, I'm not used to that. Not at all. We had one time, I'm tied to a bed, and like blindfolded, there's like a shirt blindfolding, blindfolding my eyes and I'm tied to this bed so I don't know what's gonna happen but I know Marlon has entered the scene and when he enters, you need a safe word when he comes in because you don't know what he's gonna do. He's gonna do anything that pops into his head which is like the key to his brilliance but it's also really scary when you're tied to a thing and you're blindfolded. So do you know what he does? This isn't in the movie so it's not like a giveaway. He jumps on me and just fills my mouth with air for some reason and just chokes me. I don't know why. He thought that was the best thing ever. And everyone laughed. I used to tell her. Brothers. I said, I said watch the scene from Haunted House and Haunted House 2. I have a scene with these stuffed animals and I have a love scene with this doll. And It's not love. That's not love. That was abuse. He abused the hell out of love. those dolls. It's love. And so, you know, it's just, you know, it's all done in jest, all done in fun. And I think when I, when I perform, I, I work out really hard, not because of I want to look a certain way, but because I don't want to worry about how I look. Because when, it go, when they go action, it's an outer body experience for me. I don't want to sit there and worry about what I'm looking like. I just want to do. And I physically work out so I could take on the physical task of, the things I do, sometimes I throw myself around. I, it's like I train like an athlete, literally, and I eat like an athlete until we're finished filming because I just want to be able to zone out and take a vacation from my body and really get all the best of me I can in all these scenes.
And it sounds vain, but you don't want to be looking at something that you did when you're in a cut and thinking to yourself, oh, sh like, I don't, you know, rather than focusing on the comedy when you're in a cut, you start focusing on something that makes you insecure about your body or something Yeah, I don't like even that. care about, I, I, because I work out up until that point, so I don't even care about my body. I just, I want to do stuff that surprises me, so when I'm in editing, I go, oh my God, I even know I did that. That's hilarious. We got to put that in. Um, so I try to get out of my head by training my body as much as I can so I could just be funny. Have you ever done something on set that you had to cut out afterwards because you, you felt like you went too far or you exposed yourself in a way that Every you didn't movie. want to? <laughs> Every movie. We, had see, we have scenes in this movie. I think this movie for us, me, Rick, and Mike, is maturity because there was a lot of things that we normally think are hilarious, but for this movie... And the, t the temperament of this movie and the tone of this movie, we took them out. I would go, mm, you know, that fart scene's really funny, but mm, I'm going to take it out. Because um, you're dealing with women and a, a female audience and, so, and a guy audience, so you want to please both parties. But we learned less is probably more. And there were scenes that we had, we had scenes in there that we go, let's take that out. Let's take that out. It's funny, but I don't want to hurt the, the, the fun of the movie by uh, making anything weird for anybody. So you're telling me there's no s &M scene where the sadist is just farting at the masochist or on the masochist? You know, we, we, we pulled the farts out. Come on! <laughs> but it's still funny, you know? We got some funny stuff in there. But a lot of funny stuff, and it's still broad. But there's certain things I was just like, do we need it? And, you know, I, I think the choices we made makes for a better overall movie, and you... Because what we found is people really love the two characters. People really love the, the love story. People really care about the, what's going on between them, even though it's ridiculous and funny. We found that people really care about, you know, uh, Christian and Hannah. Do you have moments in your life dating back to In Living Color, but even now where you sort of look at emails or conversations that you have on an executive level and they're kind of like, we're going to pull all the farts out of this? And you realize, like, oh, this is my life. Like, my life is, like, very, like, executive decisions about how many farts are going to be oh, in yeah. this thing we're working yeah. on. Yeah, and now, now it's getting to the point where we call it scatological. <laughs> it's not farts anymore. It's scatological humor. Um, but, yeah, we have those intellectual conversations and emails and, you know, board meetings about, uh, uh, should this... You know, when she throws the shit at him, should we keep that in? What's the intention behind the feces? What's the feces thinking? If we really think about the feces and stuff, and the fecal matters, like, and we laugh, you know, we just have that conversation. And even with the, like, the, the flatulence scene, we was just like, we've done it. And me, Rick, and Mike sat there in editing. We was like, as funny as this is, and it was really funny, is you're just meeting the character. Do you really want to go there? Let's let him build to a creepy place instead of just starting him in a crazy place. So this is a completely kind of a departure for you guys. No, it's definitely the same kind of crazy stuff we normally do. <laughs> but there's just moments where we chose to be mature. It's, it's outrageous. There's some things in there you just go, no, are you kidding me? And, but there's pockets. Women are funny. You can't. You may get away with one good, think about your girl. If you lay in bed with your girl, you may get away with one good fart, right? And she may join you on that. Like, that's just nasty, but, oh, you stupid. <laughs> but the second one does the not The second one way. is like, Brett, see, not, you play too much. Yeah. That third one, you are sleeping on the couch, and she's packing her bags, and she's out. You got to leave the room for the third one. Yeah, you but guys, get up. guys were different. The first one is like, oh, dude, that's nasty. The second one's like, ha, oh, ha, that's, you smell like an egg. And the third one is just like, ha, oh, ha, oh, you made me throw up. And by the thousandth part, you guys are on the floor laughing, going, man, that was hilarious. There is one, there, guys can go too far with the farts, though, I will say. There is a moment where guys will eventually go, all right, we're trying to, trying to watch the game here. Could you, can you not be farting all day? Yeah, that's because you guys don't have gas. Wait till the pizza kicks in, and then you guys are, all right, now it's war. That's pizza? Yeah, the pizza, that's always the, the good. Pizza and the egg, it's a wrap. But a little bit of coffee and a plum, oh, jeez. <laughs> Perfect combination there. <laughs> that's Those are men just eating for the sake to be able to fart. Later. That's what like, we yeah. do. I do that with my son sometimes. But see, kids don't know when to stop. I, me and my son, we do it all day. I'll be like, good night. I'll wake up in the middle of the morning and he's sitting there right over me going, Brr, good morning, dad. I'm like, you're grounded. That's too much. 
I didn't know. That's what the kid said. <laughs> You'll know now when you punish. <laughs> now stay in your room. <laughs> Kelly, what were what were your boundaries going into this, and were they tested? Um. Shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think what Marlon kind of was looking for for Hannah was more like Chris Farley, but who you got was more like Dennis Miller. So it was like Dennis Miller. Like, Wait, were you like throwing out <laughs> right wing jokes about the Middle East while they were shooting? Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> but what it did was it brought like even more right like, wing jokes about the Middle East. That was I mean, great. that was there. It's like he was with us, you know. But I think that kind of it changed the it changed the relationship between Christian and Hannah because it I was forced to to make my nerdist humor even more robust than I think they had envisioned for the character. But then once they knew it was there, they're like, Dennis Miller isn't so bad. No, what, what, let's it, fart on him. It, it actually... Yes, let's fart on Dennis Miller. <laughs> no, it, it actually played perfect for the character because, you know, in the movie, the, the, Hannah is a lot... She's a virgin, you know, it's not what she does. God. So the fact that she had boundaries was actually good. Her boundaries as a performer actually enhanced scenes because you could see the pullback and it forced the Christian to be a little more aggressive. And you see, I think when you see the scenes, you see that little bit of Callie and that little bit of Marlon that I think makes, that's what makes the scene work is, is that there's a, 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 the obstacle, obstacles to get over. You start with uh, one movie that you're parodying, where with Scary Movie, you're parodying Scream, Haunted House, Paranormal Activity, and with this, it's, uh, it's Fifty Shades of Grey, but within these sort of frameworks, you're, you start parodying lots of other sort of pop culture touchstones. How do you find those, and how do you plant them into the movie uh, appropriately? You know, for us, Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades of Grey was the, the, the story and the template, and that's our reservoir characters came from there. But, you know, we watched everything from... Nine and a half weeks to, you know, uh, uh, I think you had a nine and a half weeks parody and don't be a menace. Yeah, you? but yeah. see, those kind of movies you have to watch because it has the same tone, the same characters, the same kind of, you know, m mystical dude that's dark and has this life. And nine and a half weeks, Mickey Rourke's character was a little crazy, you know, and oh, he yeah. did some really wild stuff. And so we watched over a hundred movies to really. Before the, we even seen Fifty Shades of Grey, we was building, you know, a catalog of stuff that we wanted to infuse into the character. So we just housed everything in Fifty Shades of Grey. I have to ask, uh, one of my favorite roles that you've ever done, uh, Marlon, is Requiem for a Dream. I think you're an incredible dramatic actor. I'm wondering Thank if you, you ever plan. Um, and uh, I, I think it's unrecognized quite often how, how powerful you can be as a dramatic actor. I'm wondering if you ever plan to sort of do that again. Um, Maybe after they pick at the Oscars, I'll. <laughs> <laughs> There's no need for me to do it now. Uh, no, I, I would love to do more more dramatic stuff, but you know, it's 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 not. Uh, God is funny, man. He gives you what you're supposed to have when you're supposed to have it. And right now, uh, I have this opportunity to produce movies for my audience and for and I'm gaining a new audience and I'm learning as a filmmaker and I'm growing and I'm getting to the point now where I'm going to step away from parody for a little while. I'm going to do some romantic comedy. I'm going to do some buddy actions. I'm going to do um, a, a family film comedy. So these are films that you're writing and producing? That will be producing and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably be a part of the writing team, me and Rick and uh, things that we're developing, Rick, and, Rick Alvarez and I and uh, Mike Titus. And I'm also going to do, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, you know, do dramas as well, but I don't, I don't want to be the guy chasing the right. trophy. I'm not at that point yet. Right now, I'm trying to be the funniest human being on the planet. And that's just, I'm on a stage every weekend. I'm working it. I'm being, I'm getting better. I'm getting smarter about my comedy. I'm growing as a filmmaker, growing as a producer. And when those opportunities present themselves, I will take them, especially if it's like with a great, I was lucky to, get, I, I auditioned six times, but I, I work with Darren Aronofsky in the, the infancy stages of his career. And what a wonderful experience it was. And it, it, I'm performing arts high school theatrically, dramatically trained. I could do everything from Shakespeare to any drama. But comedy is just what God's presenting me. And so right now, 
I, I want to make people laugh until they cry, and then I'll get I'll go, I'll go do some com some dramas. Now you move into these new genres like romantic comedy, or like you said, away from parody a little bit, but into romantic comedy, into to buddy action. Do you worry that when you get into those, people are going to say, "Well, what happened to the parody? Where's the parody in this?" No, uh, I think I I'm I'm one of those guys that. What do you do with the guy that can do everything? He does everything. And what's great is people have accepted me in every role I've ever done and been like, wow, you did it really, you was credible in that role. And so for me, doing those things and doing those little guest appearances, whether it's working in the Coen Brothers movie or working with Aronofsky or, you know, whatever I've done, my audience always goes, hey, you, I really liked you in that. Or even if I do a character, if I do five minutes in Norbit, as the tap dance instructor, they go, that was hilarious. So now for me, it's crafting and showcase, what am I gonna showcase this movie? And um, luckily, I think, you know, as long as I stay true to whatever it is, I think the audience will follow me. You know, I, I want a career like Robin Williams had, you know, one of those careers where he, you can do everything from drama to big uh, character comedy. I wanted what Eddie Murphy's career where you know, in a scene, he's doing seven different people at the dinner table, and you don't see one ounce of Eddie Murphy. But then he goes and he does 48 hours where he, it's like a drama with some comedy in it, and you just go, wow, I love this guy. Then he does Beverly Hills Cop, and he plays the beats with, that needed to be for drama, but then he's doing, like, different characters to get, to, to get through situations. I want to be a versatile, well-rounded comedian at the end of the day, and, a, and, and that's what's going to make me a great actor. Absolutely. Uh, I think we have time for some audience questions. Hi, this is for both of you, but first of all, Marlon, I love, love white chicks. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I was just re no, I was just re re I wonder why. I, <laughs> I was doing the mock -ups. It was like my life story. <laughs> that movie was about me. I want my money. I love the mock part. Yeah. Um, when your wife is mad at you. No, oh, thank I you. I love that part. But um, this question is about you. What is the most, um, the character characteristic that you play in your movie similar to you? You go first. Why? I'm being a gentleman. Oh, are you? All right. It's um, rare. Take the opportunity. I'm taking, I'm taking it. Um, I guess this character, uh, the character of Hannah, she, she's, Definitely a nerd, and I'm 100% that. I didn't realize how much of a nerd I was. Thank you, Marlon, for You are definitely a nerd. Yeah. Like, I, she, she, she doesn't look like, normally you look at like a penis and you go, wow, that's like eight and a half inches. She, she would look at it and go, you know the square root of that penis is, if I look at that diameter, it's radius pi. I'm sorry. I'm so upset you dragged pi into this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like I kind of feel like just in general, like an introverted extrovert. So like to be an actress, you have to be out there and talking in front of people and working with, you know, really handsome, crazy guys and try to seem like you're cool with it. But inside, I'm still very like kind of the awkward nerd person. And that's really what Hannah is like in this movie. She's a virgin who meets like a freaky billionaire and there, she doesn't even know what to do with it. And she's not even, she's a nerd who isn't smart enough to run away. Like, what kind of a person is that? That's, that's me in a nutshell. And uh, for me, um, I guess the thing that's similar to me and Christian is that we're freaky. <laughs> <laughs> next, ne Google me, bitch. I do this. <laughs> <laughs> next question. Ew, you just said that to her. Oh, my <laughs> like, God. Oh. Hi guys. So uh, the first thing I want to say is I'm looking forward to this film as much as everyone else in this room probably agrees with me. So my question is, did anybody from the original film, The Fifty Shades of Grey, reach out to you and share their opinions, what they thought when you came up with this idea? Uh, nobody reached out. <laughs> but God is funny. I'm up at Chateau Marmont one night, me and my buddies, right? And uh, across from me is this woman and my buddy knows her. So he brings, he goes, I want to introduce you to somebody. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go over to meet her. He goes, hey, Marla Wayans, this is E.L. James, <laughs> writer of Fifty Shades of Grey. I said, hey! <laughs> she goes, so you're doing a movie about me? I said, no, it's not a, a biopic. It's, it's not, a, not about you, but it's about your movie. She goes, mm, sit down, let's have a couple of drinks. 
So we had some drinks. And, you know, we get pretty smashed together. And um, I don't know. I, 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 it, it was a really fun conversation. At one point, she goes, um, can I see the film? I said, she goes, I, I, I said, yeah, if sure. She goes, what, is there something offensive? I said, there may be a few things you may not be comfortable with. <laughs> I'll say this, there's about one or two jokes you ain't gonna like. She goes, you know, fuck it, let my kids see it. I don't need to. <laughs> but I took a picture with her, we put it on uh, Instagram, and uh, that was, it was like a, a great mo moment. Like if I, if one day when I write a book, I don't know how the hell that's gonna happen because I'm terrible at writing. Um, that's one of those stories that's gonna be in my book. Did you ever have one of those moments before with like scary movie or anything like Wes Craven or Reach Out or anything like that? Um, um, hmm. Go with no. I don't remember. <laughs> it's been that was a long time ago, and you know, between like then and probably all the drinks I've had, multiplied that by the number of times I've been around people smoking weed and getting contact highs. I probably don't remember none of that shit. <laughs> Next question from the audience. Hi, Marlon. Right here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hi. I thought he was saying that. I said, damn. There you go. <laughs> um, so I have to say, yesterday you got me in trouble because I was watching White Chicks on the quiet train and I was laughing so hard, and the old woman next to me is like, young lady, this is the quiet train. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so I was... <laughs> the quiet train? I know, quiet what train. In New York? What, what train is that? <laughs> it's like on the um, Acceler or something. It's where, like, it's like dim lighting, library-like settings, and people nap, and I guess I woke them up. It sounds like the train where you can't even wear Beats by Dre's. You gotta wear bows. <laughs> there you go. Um, Just a bunch of white people with their bows on. Oh, I love this. No blacks here at all. It's <laughs> mm, wonderful. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm going to be... Uh, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get you in trouble. Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. it's okay. Um, so Don't feel bad, though. I got a little girl grounded. Uh -huh. um, she was watching A Haunted House, and her dad was like... She was like four, 13 years old. She watched A Haunted House. And her dad was like, oh, that's funny. Me and my, we're going to watch it tonight as a family. And so he watched it with his wife and the 13-year-old daughter. And he got to the sex scene with the doll. Oh, and he looked at his daughter and said, you're grounded. <laughs> I think it was the part when the, when the doll started licking my butt. That there you go. That's probably, that was it. Everything else he was fine with. I mean, yeah, but who no doesn't problem. toss doll salad, right? <laughs> so... Since uh, Fifty Shades Darker is coming out and it's going to give you a lot of muse, can we expect like a sequel like Fifty Shades Blacker? Um, that would that would definitely be the title. <laughs> but I, you know, honestly, I, I, if Haunted, I'm, if Haunted House, I mean, if the, if um, if uh, Fifty Shades of Black does well, I'll, I'll 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 be more motivated to like make a sequel. But um, uh, you don't, I don't want to make a, I don't want to curse it. I don't want to make a sequel to, if it bombs, I ain't going to make a sequel to a bomb movie. Like, there's never going to be a Howard the Duck 2. Like, nobody, <laughs> nobody does that. Um, there will be a reboot, though, of Howard, du Howard the Duck. There will definitely be a reboot. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. I'll try that again. Yeah, I don't think that one. Um, <laughs> but I, I, want, I want to say before you guys, I, I'm, I'm doing a stand-up comedy. Uh, I got a couple of dates I want to uh, throw out there. Uh, January 22nd, I'm going to be at the Orpheum Theater in New Orleans doing stand-up comedy. Uh, that's January 22nd, Friday. Um, then I'm going to be Gen February 12th through the 14th. I'm going to be at Caroline's in New York City. Um, yeah, so you guys check that out. Uh, I'll be there all weekend. Or is that February 14th through the set? What is that? 14th through the 17th? Oh, 12th through the 14th, I'm at uh, Caroline's New York. And then February uh, 19th, I'm at the Aztec Theater in San Antonio. And then on February 20th, I'm at the um, uh, House of Blues in Dallas, Texas. That's all. Nice. All right. I think we have time for one, one more question ah, from the Ah, go for two. <laughs> you ready? Brother, here you go. You sure? Yeah, with your Afghanistan star scarf. You, like you just came from war. I thought I was cool. You forgot one more thing on the paper. You were supposed to bring me on those. You forgot? Oh, you do stand-up? 
A little bit, just a little bit. Okay. Leave All me right. alone, I got you. Okay. All right, what is the biggest thing you've learned starting from the scary movie parodies to the parodies you do now? Uh, the biggest thing I've learned is, um, you know, uh, you know, every movie is different, and you have to change the formula a little bit. Um, you can't stick to old formulas because the people change, the youth change, the culture changes, the pop culture changes. And so what I try and do is grow with and go with whatever is happening at the time. And do like when we did Haunted House, the reason why we did it steady cam style was because that was the nature of the kind of filmmaking that they were doing. Everything was reality type of filming. And so that's how we shot things. And we try to infuse everything that we can. It's like in this movie, the tone of the movie is so serious and so intense that instead of going hugely broad with every joke, we did a couple of takes. I do a very broad take. Then I do a grounded take that we call the Bond take, that this one loved the Bond take. 007, 007. oh my God. And because we wanted to say, we, we'd have these, comp, these arguments, and we'd be saying the most ridiculous things, but it's the stuff that we're saying that is so funny and it's so important to these characters. We play it dead straight, and it's absolutely hilarious. So it's just, I think the key is stay within the tone of whatever genre you're doing and not just do something ridiculous because it's ridiculous. Try to really m mimic the tone, and then from the tone, you break out and you do absolute funny stuff. But it has to start in a grounded place, especially with a movie like Fifty Shades of Black with Greg. I'm curious, uh, you know, you, you started working on it with In Living Color and you started working with your brothers. Do you still uh, show them your scripts that you're working on? Do you still work with Damon and, and, and the family you know, at all? I, I would love to, you know, but they're, they're busy doing what they, doing their stuff and I don't, I don't want to bother them with my stuff. Like, hey, can you guys take a minute to do, and I don't, I'm not a guy that, it's hard because I don't, I don't, I can't wait for notes that long because when we go, we got to go. It's like I got five weeks of pre-production and I got four weeks, if that, to film. So if I get notes, I need them right away. And I don't want to um, belabor my brothers, and I want to bother them like, hey, Sean, Keenan, you think you could get those notes from me? And Keenan's real cool with it, too. Just, mm, mm, I'll read it next year. <laughs> but, but I need that, the notes right now. Mm-hmm. You tell them to wait until next year. Mm. And, and, you know, and I love, I love working with my brothers. I miss working with my brothers. Um, and I love the collective unit because we all see things so differently that it makes for something you know, really special when we get together. Absolutely, I think that's all uh, the time that we have. Uh, when does Fifty Shades of Black open, Marlon? Fifty Shades of Black opens February 29th. It stars my... I kind of knew that, I didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna correct him, I felt bad. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. I'm sorry, I'm in a time warp right now. I, I'm working so much, like I, I, I've been in like eight different cities in six days. So um, I, it opens January 29th, January 29th. It just sounds like February, right? January, February, no, it doesn't, I'm just sleeping. <laughs> Stars myself um, and the wonderful Miss Kelly Hawk. Um, great cast, uh, Mike Epps comes in and rocks it. Uh, Jane Seymour, uh, Fred Willard, um, Atheon Crockett, who is absolutely hilarious. A newcomer, Jenny Zagrino, just slays it. And uh, King Batch also was in it. And Flores Henderson, you gotta see me and Flores Henderson scene. Yes, I did miss Brady. <laughs> All right, thank you guys, thanks so much. Thanks, Callie.